Hello everybody, I'm Robert Franz, music director of the Windsor Symphony Orchestra, and I am here today with our principal second violin, Emily Perret. Emily, welcome. Hi, thank you. It's so good to have you. So you are here today, not only because you're a fantastic musician in the WSO, and I want to find out more about you as a musician and as a person, but also because this season you're going to be performing a concerto with the orchestra, a concerto called The Lark Ascending by the English composer Rafe Vaughan Williams. And I definitely want to talk about that as well. But before that, let's begin at the beginning. How did you get interested in the violin? Well, actually, um, I mean, it just found me. I have to say I started very, very young. Um, I don't have any memories of my life before playing the violin. And it's actually my mom and my grandmother who had the idea to sign me up for violin lessons. And it, it just took. And uh, here I am today, just continued in that path. So as a child, you, you didn't ever sort of push back against taking lessons or was that just part of your life and there was no question? Uh, I did push back. I mean, I was a kid. I think I want to say a kid like a lot of other kids um, didn't always want to practice. Wasn't my favorite activity. However, playing with other people has always been a tremendous passion. Like that was definitely the pull, right? But, you know, in order to do that, you do have to spend some time in the practice room um, and learn the instrument and everything. But I mean, overall, and like, you know, um, there are so many opportunities like music camp and, you know, even performances. Um, I really enjoyed um, as a kid. How old were you when you decided to go from something that you had to do to something that you wanted to do and devoted your life to being a musician? Um, that's a complicated question. I didn't question it a lot. Like I was pretty set from an early age in becoming a violinist. Um, however, when I was 17 and there were all those options for university and whatnot, then I was like, oh, maybe maybe I should see if something else. And what ended up happening is that I was pursuing a, okay, <laughs> the degree that I picked also was like um, arts and literature, uh, cinema, uh, you know, acting, that kind of stuff. So it was very connected to my life as a violinist, but I found out um, halfway through that um, in fact, the degree was a hobby and I was still very serious about the violin. And I was like, you know what? That's actually, I'm certain that's what I want to do, right? That, like the violin was always the thing and everything else was a hobby, if you will, where usually it's the opposite, right? Some people will be like, this is my life and I take violin lessons and that's a hobby and that's great. But I realized for me that that was flipped and I was like, oh, okay, so this is my life, right? And where did you end up doing your studies at university as a violinist? Um, I was uh, studying at a place in Montreal called a uh, conservatoire or like a conservatory, um, which is a smaller school. I would say that still offers uh, university degrees, but where, you know, we're a very small group of students. So there's a lot of attention from the teachers and um, yeah, it's an amazing environment, I think, to grow as a musician. And when you finished that, what was the transition like into professional violin playing? I mean, what was your first job? How did that sort of, how did that, how did you go oh, from yeah. being a student to eating based on your work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So while I was still in school, when I was 18, I did a summer program called Orchestre de la Francophonie, or Francophonie Orchestra. Um, and I was playing at the front stand of the second violins in a full orchestra, and I'm in love with um, the orchestra repertoire. Um, I think it's just the best thing ever. And, um, and at that time, that summer, I was like, you know what? I think that's what I want to do. I think I even want to play at the front of the second violins. Um, but I didn't right away get there because you know you get seduced by all the opportunities while you're in school and the summer programs and then I was like oh you know I want to do everything I want to do contemporary music I want to tour I want to play like solos I want to do uh, chamber music all that stuff and um and that's what I did a bit I did some freelancing and everything and then somebody said um I met somebody uh in a 
Charlottetown musical, Anne of Green Gables, and she was an oboe player who played in the Thunderbird Symphony. And she said, hey, why don't you come like play over there? And then they had an audition and then I auditioned and I started working the Thunder Bay Symphony. Um, and then from there, um, I don't mind saying I kind of followed my heart. So sometimes it was about following um, love interests. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I auditioned in uh, those orchestras and um, I currently play in London, Ontario, in Windsor, of course. Um, Halifax, Symphony Nova Scotia, and recently, just recently, got a position with uh, the Hamilton Philharmonic in the first violin section. So that's a new thing because it has been at least 10 years since I haven't really full, full time uh, played in the first. So that, that must be an interesting balance for you because I know when you started at the Windsor Symphony, which was back, I believe, in 2008, you were a section violinist. So you sort of bounced back and forth between first and seconds, I think. But it was in 2019 that you won the principal second um, position. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to lead the second violins in the Windsor Symphony. You know, I don't know if every orchestra that you play in sits the way we do. So our audience sees you sitting at the front to my right across from the first violins, which is a little bit different than some orchestras do it when they're nestled behind the first. Tell us a little bit about that experience for you. Well, that was a totally new experience. I mean, you and I have discussed it and we've tried uh, this new seating and going back. Um, I had tried it before and I have to say that, you know, it's like anything, right? Sometimes you think about change and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can handle a change. And then suddenly you get used to it. And definitely there are advantages to playing um, beside the first, but also across. And I think for me, uh, visually, is where I gain the most from being on the other side, uh, visually in terms of seeing um, mostly Lillian's bow, maybe Tino's bow, um, the front stand. And also another advantage is sitting with the basses. Um, so really I have like the full experience. I can see the violas very well as well. Like I, I really like to connect visually with uh, my colleagues. And I feel that from that spot, it gives me like just because it's kind of like the reverse. It's like the concert master in the other side of the mirror, except I'm not the concert master. Or, like I'm, I don't make any real calls, but in terms of visually, I have a similar experience. I'm assuming um, as the one that Lillian has, and that's very useful in trying to fit in the 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 quintet the string quintet of the orchestra now you said one of the advantages was sitting so close to the basses and the cello line why is that well just harmonic uh harmonically like uh where the piece is going but also just because i find that they often ground um the beat if you will like the pulse of the music like and uh and while i see the first then i connect like i'm i'm I can connect all that together. So they bring that part of it. Like they drive the piece. Now, uh, your role is going to change for the concert that is coming up uh, in January. And that is you will step away from your chair as principal second, and you will stand in the solo position and perform Ray Vaughan Williams' The Lark Ascending. I, I don't mind telling you, this is, I think, one of the most beautiful pieces in all of the repertoire for solo violin. And one of the things that I love about the piece is that in my mind at least, I sort of divide up music between poetry and prose. You have music that is very sort of dramatic and tells a story, and then sometimes you have music that is more poetic in nature. And this piece is most definitely, I think, poetic in nature. In, face, in fact, it's based on a poem about an ascending lark. Um, so it seemed to me when I asked you to do this that you have the perfect personality and mix and sound to sort of put together the music and the poetry to create this piece. Tell me about your approach to this piece or your sort of connection to this piece of music and why you said yes. yes. Okay. Well, and also first, thank you for all those kind words. Um, I'm very touched to hear that because I uh, think it's a gorgeous piece of music as well. Um, and I've read the poem, like uh, there's a bit of it that's quoted on the music, but actually it's a long poem. And 
it's it's almost like I mean it's not like uh, von Williams took it line by line, but there are so many aspects of the poem that uh, are included in the whole piece. Um, so what's my approach to the piece? First, um, I went to listen to what larks sound like. <laughs> um, well, just because, okay, so like the piece is kind of like in two parts and there's one part that is maybe, um, so a lot of the pieces with the orchestra where I'll have the chance to collaborate with my colleagues, which is my favorite thing and all that. But there are bits of the piece that are just solo violin, right? Like complete alone no orchestra, you guys will have to listen to me. I'm playing by myself. And it's very free. There are no, like, it's not measured really. Like, I, I can do whatever I want. And as I was approaching that, maybe that's the most challenging part, like, of deciding where this is going to go. And I mean, I, ultimately, I want it to be like the bird, right? And like, you know, how like birds sometimes they just soar, they go like, I, it even sounds like the birds disappearing. Like, you're watching that bird, and at some point, you don't see it anymore and it's not really clear when that happens music just ends and it's like but i realized that the bird call comes back all the time the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because that's what the lark does and then i was like okay so those parts i can really take my time because the birds actually don't go mm -mm 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 -mm. like right they kind of go just like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and so Anyway, so that's how I started. <laughs> and then um, when I was asked to play uh, this piece, I hesitated uh, just because of what you're saying, how my role was in the orchestra or my role is in the orchestra. And this is going to be kind of like a big gift um, to be able to go a terrifying gift that I'm really excited about. Um, but to go there and take the responsibility and the, the, the spotlight um, for that piece. And um, when you asked me that, I actually reconnected with my teacher from university time. And we had not spoken for a while. Like we kept in touch and stuff. And I just discussed that with her. And, and you know, I, I went back and played for her. And that was like an amazing time as well. So like there are so many like this is going to be a full life changing experience type of thing. It's already started and yeah, I'm really excited. I am so happy to hear that. And it's really interesting that you sort of bring in the nostalgia for you personally, because I think there is also a sense of nostalgia in this piece. One of the things that's sort of interesting is that back in 1914, when Ron Williams first wrote this, larks were much more prevalent in England than they are today. It's much more difficult to hear a lark song today than it was a hundred years ago. So I think there is a sense of a time gone by and nostalgia in this piece, in addition to just its beauty and its poetry, but that feeling of looking back. And I love that you're going to be feeling that on different levels as well as you perform it. What yeah. is the difference in the actual musical preparation for what you'll do as a concerto soloist than what you do as principal second violin in the orchestra? How are those things different? Um, well well, as a soloist, I, I feel like I'll be almost deciding everything, right? Well, you'll be deciding stuff too. Um, but I've, like in terms of my interpretation and in terms of, like, I mean, of, obviously, like, I mean, there are so many amazing solos in the orchestra. Like I'm going to single out French horn and clarinet uh, especially. And it, like there are lots of collab things, but like, I think the way I will prepare this is I'm going in and I can decide all my ideas. When I prepare to be principal second, I depend largely on what the first will be doing. Um, even, you know, for Boeing's, but even for phrasing and stuff, I depend a lot on what the conductor uh, wants the piece to be like or any other colleagues. Like the principal second role is, or even just second violence, is a lot more about uh, blending, supporting, uh, you know, adapting uh, would be the three words probably that I would use to describe that job. Where as a soloist, I'm just, I'm going to be uh, sharing uh, the deepest parts of my heart. <laughs> I mean, I do that too as principal second, but this time it's going to be really all out there, right? Like I'm in the forefront. So I'm excited. I think it's going to 
it will, you know, I will end up knowing myself as a player a lot more through that experience. And probably I'll be able to bring that back to being the principal second. But uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to open up well, and give it all. I love this process. And I, I, I do really respond to what you're saying because when I work with a soloist, my very first question is, what does that soloist feel? What do they bring to the piece? And then of course, as a conductor, my job is also to have opinions about the piece, but it's very much a negotiation back and forth. And it's also my desire in this case to be in the supporting role to bring this concerto to life in a way that makes you feel like you've, you've created something artistically that you're really proud of and that you really connect with. And so I also have, you and I are gonna be sort of swapping roles in this and I have sort of a more of a support, supporting character kind of aspect to conducting a concerto. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to that as well because even though like there are all those cadences where I'm gonna be on my own, I do thrive on collaborating with people and exchanging and, and swapping not just roles but energy as well, right? And, and I even discussed this briefly with Lillian, uh, the concertmaster, and she has performed that piece before and um, that's just, like I'm just gonna feel she's gonna be right there and she knows what's going on and that's gonna be kind of like a reassuring thing as well for me. Well, Lillian, as you know, is a very supporting uh, person and musician in our orchestra and is really there for everybody. And I am thrilled beyond words that you have agreed to and will be performing The Lark Ascending by Rafe Vaughn Williams with us in January. So Emily, thank you so much for spending time with me today and we look forward to your performance of this great masterpiece. Thank you so much, Robert. It's gonna be great.